at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. I am also the hospital epidemiologist at Mount Sinai, Queens, and also the lead investigator at Mount Sinai, Queens for our COVID clinical trials unit. And we are a site that participated in um, the Johnson & Johnson COVID vaccine trial, um, which is still ongoing. The data that has been released is the preliminary data, and it is very exciting data. Um, so basically, the trials are still ongoing. We are going to follow the patients for a full two years. But the data that was released was data looking at um, looking at outcomes, considering that more than eight weeks of the that more more than eight weeks has passed since at least half the participants have um, received the vaccine. And so what this data showed is it showed a really good protection against people who received the vaccine, for people who received the vaccine against getting sick enough to needing to go to the hospital or leading to death. The real excitement about the data is that there were no hospital, there were no COVID related hospitalizations or COVID deaths in the participants who received vaccine when you're looking um, more than 28 days from, from receipt of vaccine. So remember, the issue with COVID is that it makes people sick and sends them to the hospital, um, or even worse, leads to death. So the goal of a vaccine is really to prevent those bad outcomes. So when we're talking about results from clinical trials, we talk about specifically efficacy. We talk about how well some intervention um, prevented whatever bad outcome you're trying to prevent um, in the setting of, of a clinical trial. And so using the term efficacy is actually really important when you're talking about um, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So basically the results were that in the US, it protected, it had an efficacy of 72% against moderate and severe disease. And what that means is that the people who received vaccine were 72% fewer, 72% less likely to get moderate or severe vac um, disease. They also, as I mentioned before, the people who had vaccine, none of them needed to be hospitalized for COVID or, or died as related to COVID. So this is um, a key question that I get asked a lot. So the overall sort of publication data that everyone's seeing in the news is this concept of, you know, of 66% efficacy around the world, 72% efficacy um, in the US, which is really impressive efficacy. Um, a key thing for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is that it is only one dose. So after only one dose and giving time for 28 days to create an immune response to that one dose, we saw impressive protection against moderate and severe disease and complete protection against, complete protection against hospitalization and death. And it's the this is really important because remember, that is the point. That is what is concerning about COVID is that it sends people to the hospital. Some people die. And again, the concern is about the severe disease. So it's a huge protection. When you compare against some of the other vaccines um, that have had their data released, the overall efficacy is higher at, you know, sort of closer to 90% and even more. But the issue there is that is after after two doses. For Johnson & Johnson, it's impressive efficacy at 72% and protection against admissions and death is, is after only one dose. So that has huge benefits. The benefits of being able to, um, to get the protection more quickly, because it's only one dose. The benefits of being able to get more doses to more people. So this really has the potential to be a real game changer in our fight against the pandemic. So for each of these vaccines, they each have um, pros and cons. So the real benefit for the Janssen Janssen for the Janssen Johnson Johnson vaccine is that um, is the fact that it's only one dose. The fact that it's only one dose allows people allows more people to get it, and also 
allows that more people get the full protection because lo logistically it can be very hard for people to come back um, to get a second dose. It also with the same amount of supply, we can vaccinate more people. Other issues about the logistics that are definitely better with this vaccine, um, it is much easier to store and to, um, and to um, transport. And so that logistically is really helpful. Um, some of the other vaccines require really strong super freezers and that is not possible for, um, for many places. So this is a vaccine that could be distributed and administered in a doctor's office um, or could be distributed and administered at at a health fair um, because you only need one dose and it's much easier to store it and to transport it. Other aspects about our vaccine that have um, a real strength to it as well is that, um, is that with only one dose, you perhaps also have a lower risk of side effects. Just with two doses, you have sort of two opportunities for side effects. Um, so, so only having one dose could be could be associated with lower side effects. Um, once, once, once we get all the data published about the side effects, um, we can make a more direct comparison. But from what was released in the press release, um, it seems very well tolerated. Only 9% of people reported fever after vaccine and 0.2% of them, so very, very small, reported fevers that were bad enough um, to prevent people from that interfered with their daily activities. Um, so the real pluses of this vaccine is the one dose seems to be well tolerated. It also um, it also is easy to transport. And again, this vaccine works really well um, at the 72 percent um, efficacy against moderate and severe disease and no cases um, of hospitalizations, um, COVID hospitalizations or COVID deaths. So it's a good vaccine that will be easy, um, that will be easier to use, and the same supply will get to more people. One other aspect that we haven't quite discussed yet, yet is that um, is that the Johnson Johnson trials included sites in South Africa as well as sites in South America, while they were. Um, new variants of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, while there were new variants circulating. So we do have data for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine against, um, against these new variants. Um, the protection was not as high for the new variants as it was um, in areas that did not have the new variant circulating. Um, the protection was 7% in South Africa. However, again, there was no hospitalizations or deaths from COVID in South Africa. So that does um, so that does show that there is really good protection even against these new variants, um, protecting against hospitalizations and deaths. So that is is a huge piece of information which we have for our vaccine that um, some of the other vaccines that did not do um, their trials in those countries or did them earlier um, when when the variants weren't circulating. So we do actually have real world data um, about protection against the new variants and it's very promising. So the important thing is to get the vaccine that is offered to you. The first vaccine that you can get is what you should get. All of these vaccines have, are very good and have really good protection. Um, really good protection against um, moderate and severe disease, really good protection against hospital, COVID hospitalizations and COVID deaths. And that is the important, and that is what is important with the vaccines. None of the vaccines at this point have data against, um, have data about um, asymptomatic disease. So we can't really compare about that. And so, because each of the vaccines um, that we've had data released so far are really good vaccines, you should get you should get the vaccine that's offered to you. So this is a great question. So the Johnson Johnson vaccine is a vaccine um, that's what we call a viral vector vaccine. So basically how it works is that it uses adenovirus, which is a virus um, that does not make people sick. Um, and that is basically a way that it transmits into your body um, the information to make the spike protein. So the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the virus that causes COVID-19, the spike protein is what is one of 
the main proteins that the immune system builds its response against. And actually all of the vaccines that are um, in phase three studies at this point that are farthest along in development all work by creating immune responses to the spike protein. How they differ is, is how they expose your immune system to the spike protein. So the mRNA vaccines, which are the two vaccines that currently have FDA emergency use authorization, they both are what um, they are both the mRNA vaccines. And basically, what they do is that they um, expose. Basically, what they do is that they get mRNA, um, which is the instructions for your cells to make the protein. And they basically, in how the vaccines are made, help to get the mRNA into the cells to make the protein. The way the viral virus vectors, the adenovirus, which is how Johnson & Johnson works and also AstraZeneca, is that they use um, they use this viral vector, the adenovirus, to get the information of how to make the protein into your cells. Um, and, so, and so it's just a different way of how to get the same information into your cells so that, so that your cells can make this important protein so that your immune system can respond. Um, some of the other virus, some of the other vaccines that are far along in development, like the Novavax, um, uses a different technique, what we call a subunit um, vaccine. And basically, what that means is that they have the actual proteins pre-made in the vaccine, and then and then the vaccine includes the proteins, and then it also includes what we call an adjuvant, something that's that wakes up your immune system to tell your immune system to respond to the proteins. Um, and that's and that's what is part of that vaccine. And so those are basically the main types of vaccines that are um, farthest along in development. They all create immune system to the same protein. They just differ in how they get that um, protein into your body so that your body can create the, the immune system. The important thing is that none of the current vaccines that are farthest along, none of them have um, actually have the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the virus that causes COVID in the vaccine. So none of them can give you COVID. So what we did, as you mentioned, we participated in the trial. So there was a site at Mount Sinai, Queens, and I was the lead investigator for that site. And there was also um, a site at Mount Sinai, Brooklyn. And so what we did is we recruited members of our community um, who were interested in participating in a trial, um, brought them in, talked to them about the details of the study, um, and, then, um, and then informed them of of everything that it would entail. And then basically we gave everyone either placebo um, an injection that would not trigger an immune response, an injection of saline that, that did not contain the investigational vaccine or the investigational vaccine. Um, it was a 50-50 chance of which one you get. We call this a placebo controlled because half the people got placebo, half the people get vaccine double blind randomized control trial. So the randomized means that it was random, whether they got placebo or vaccine, sort of like a flip of a coin um, that was done in a centralized station, a centralized location. And we call it double blind. What double blind means is that neither the person, the participant receiving um, the investigational product knew if it was placebo or knew if it was investigational vaccine, neither do the investigators. So I didn't know what the people were getting. And this is really important because if someone knew that they got vaccine, um, that may impact how they participate in the study. So after the people got vaccine, what, what we did is that they filled out on their phone twice a week um, whether they had any symptoms that could be associated with COVID. And, and if they did, then we had them do a nasal swab um, to to check to see if they did have an infection with SARS-CoV-2 to see if they did have COVID. Um, and then we followed them up with some more nasal swabs and also um, continuing to ask about their symptoms. And so as you see, so much of this is about symptoms. It's really important that people don't know whether they got placebo or vaccine. Because if you knew that you got vaccine, you might discount symptoms. You might be like, oh, I've already nose, but that could just be, be my allergies because I got vaccine, I'm probably protected. And so we wanted as much as possible to have that people would not know which one 
which product they got, which of the investigational, whether they got um, the vaccine or whether they got the placebo when they were interpreting and reporting their symptoms. This was the first clinical trial that we've ever participated in Mount Sinai, Queens or Mount Sinai, Brooklyn. And that is really exciting. That is opening up clinical research to our communities in Queens and Brooklyn, giving them the opportunity to participate if they if they are interested. And especially when you're talking about something like COVID vaccine, um, we started enrolling people in November. And that means that half of our participants already um, received the investigational vaccine that really provides a lot of protection. They were able to start getting the vaccine um, you know, before this increase, before this current winter surge, we were able to get people protection earlier. Now it's a clinical trial. We didn't know whether the vaccine would work or not. And we make that very clear to the people when they are, are choosing to enroll. So access to trials is not always access to, to a treatment that works or a vaccine that works. In this case, it did. It's also really important to offer to, um, to our communities in Brooklyn and Queens because these are some of our most diverse communities. Especially in Queens, we are very close to, um, to areas that were very hard hit by COVID, but also to some of the most diverse areas in the whole world. And so it's really important to make sure that everyone has, has um, access to research. And also it's really important to, in, to ensure that these trials include diverse populations. We need to make sure that a representation of America, representation of who we would be offering these treatments were included in the trials. And we're very happy to say that by having a site in Queens, we were able to include a diverse community.